Hello, everyone, and welcome to our final Let's Talk Opera for the 2023-2024 season. My name is Joshua Bortz, and I'm the resident scholar of Virginia Opera, and I am delighted to welcome you to this virtual preview of Madama Butterfly. If you are joining us this evening, as this is being uh, recorded live, uh, please remember to log on to Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, wherever it is that you are watching and joining this evening uh, in order to comment, ask questions as we go through our preview. If you are watching this after the fact, maybe uh, preparing for a performance or just getting back from taking in this stunning drama and thrilling music, please remember that you can comment on uh, any of these videos, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. We have a lot to talk about, and I'm excited that you are with us today or joining us uh, after the fact in this conversation. Additionally, even though this is the end of our 2023-2024 season, don't worry, there's plenty more opera uh, with Virginia Opera. We have our gala season coming up in all three markets in Norfolk, Richmond, and Fairfax, so you can continue the party with music, food, friends, and more. Additionally, we have announced our 2024-2025 season, so there's much to look forward to next year as the company celebrates its 50th anniversary, starting with the completion of Wagner's Ring Cycle with The Twilight of the Gods, moving to a new production of Bizet's classic Carmen, Mozart's Cosi van Dutte returns to the stage, and then we of course end the season with the world premiere of Damien Jeter and Jessica Murphy Moo's Loving v. Virginia. Cannot wait for that project to come to fruition and for you all to hear the incredible new music of that piece along with classics of the operatic repertory. So now let's turn our attention to Madama Butterfly and discuss all of the different ways that we can look at this classic opera. Now, leading into our Let's Talk opera this evening, a question was asked on social media. And the question was essentially this. I'm going to paraphrase just a little bit. Should we think of Madame Butterfly, Madama Butterfly, as an Italian opera set in Asia or an Asian opera that happens to be sung in Italian? And I believe that we can only really look at Madama Butterfly through the former lens. This is an Italian opera that happens to be set in Japan, that happens to use a Japanese geisha as its protagonist, that happens to grapple with what happens when cultures collide and when cultural misunderstandings and cataclysm takes place. But this is entirely from a European perspective, particularly an Italian perspective, as we shall see. So I want to begin this evening by talking about Italian opera in the 19th century, in the 1800s, because this is our key to understanding kind of how we should start to grapple with and think about all of the complicated themes in Madama Butterfly. So if you remember back to the fall when we talked about Virginia Opera's production of The Barber of Seville, we talked about the era of the bel canto, the era of beautiful singing that takes us in Italy from about the year 1800 to 1850. It is a singer-based art form. The orchestra is simply there to accompany. And this bel canto style, uh, most represented through composers like Rossini uh, Bellini and Donizetti, is about doing what Italians do best, which is to write melody. This is a melodic form of opera. As time moves on, however, the bel canto begins to transform, and it transforms because of none other than Giuseppe Verdi. And we get into what we call the era of Verdi. In Italian opera, he dominated so fully that he kind of gets his own era. Were there other composers writing in Italy during the middle of the 19th century? Absolutely. However, his operas absolutely dominated and he changed the way that Italians think and write about vocal music. What he does in his operas, starting in the 1850s and moving on towards the end of the century, is he introduces a much more passionate style of singing, much more full-throated, 
much more rhythmic. And he also uh, brings out a dramatic specificity in his uh, in his operas. Now, we talked about this a little bit last year when we previewed uh, Verdi's La Traviata. So if you're curious to learn more, please refer to that preview on YouTube, Facebook, or wherever it is that you were watching this. But when we talk about dramatic specificity, what we mean is uh, that the music that is written for each character can only be sung by that character. Before Verdi, different uh, composers would borrow from themselves, characters would sing lines sung by someone that they hate, what have you. But Verdi comes along and he writes music that is very specifically tied to that character. This is something new. This is something akin to what Shakespeare did uh, around the year 1600 in Elizabethan theater, bringing full life into the characters on the operatic stage. He still writes incredible melodies. He still is writing predominantly a vocal form of Italian opera, uh, meaning that the voice is what is most prized over the orchestra. But things begin to get bigger. Things become more specific. Things become more passionate, which then leads us to some cross currents that begin to influence Italian opera and that will lead us to Madama Butterfly. First, we get the era of Wagner. Now, Verdi and Wagner are almost exact contemporaries. They were both born in the year 1813 and both would go on to uh, dominate and to transform their respective Italian uh, and German traditions. And what Wagner does, and we talked about this when we looked at Siegfried earlier this season, and I would refer to that preview if you want to learn more about this, but Wagner essentially brings in a greater use of the orchestra, that the orchestra is what is most important. He brings in larger musical structures. What we mean by that is that in uh, earlier operas, you have kind of song, recitative, or the speak singing that happens, and then a duet, recitative, you get all of these different numbers. But what Wagner starts to do is he starts to conceive of entire scenes and eventually entire acts as one symphonic idea. And that begins to take hold and greatly transforms the music of his time. He also introduces a system that he called leitmotif. And that basically means that different characters, different uh, plot points, emotions, anything at all in an opera is given a theme song. And that theme song changes and grows as we move through the opera. So these three big ideas start to infiltrate every form of operatic and artistic expression during the middle to late decades of the 1800s. So you have Italian vocal music writing for the voice. You then get the dramatic specificity of Verdi happening at the same time as the orchestra and musical structures and musical themes begin to crop up in all kinds of operatic material. Additionally, the French are writing their great operas, particularly the works of Bizet, writing Carmen, that you'll see next year at Virginia Opera, uh, the works of Gounod with Faust and Romeo and Juliet and others, and then eventually with composers like Massenet. And they are bringing their French style of harmony and of theater and of pacing and of local color, meaning uh, a wantingness, a willingness to depict real life as it is. Granted, everyone's singing, but essentially this kind of interest in what is happening on the streets, what is happening in the everyday life of the people around us. And all of these currents begin to converge around the year 1890 with what we call the Giovane Scuola, the young school. These are younger composers. They did not grow up with the bel canto tradition. They grew up with Verdi being an established older man. And they grow up starting to get to know the ideas of Wagner and of the French romantics. These are composers who are not afraid of music that is outside of the Italian peninsula. Something that a couple decades before, would have been absolutely anathema. It would have been hated. Uh, in fact, Verdi, one of the biggest uh, 
insults that could be hurled at him is that he was interested in German music and bringing that in. By the time we get to 1890, those lines are starting to blur and composers are starting to play around with all of these ideas. Now, as you will see, Puccini is one of these composers who is taking the Italian school of composition and blending it with German influences, the orchestra, larger structures, um, and motific development, and mixing it with the French ideas of exoticism and local color and harmony to create a whole new style of Italian opera. Now, these composers, these young composers, were most associated with the Milan Conservatory, and they were tied to a word that we call verismo, which is kind of the Italian word for realism, although it's not a direct translation. And what these operas are interested in, what these composers begin to do, is they tell stories that are intensely passionate, that are violent, that are provocative, that are about different social classes, uh, that are interested in that French local color and depicting communities and life on stage. They are interested in exoticism or exploring cultures from outside of Italy and bringing in these Wagnerian and French ideas. Now, this all begins, as you see here, with the opera Cavalleria Rusticana, which means rustic chivalry. And this is a dark and serious story about a, a, a poor Sicilian town and all the drama and murder that takes place in this very kind of pressure cooker of a community. This, along with Leon Cavallo's Pagliacci, The Clowns, which tells the story of uh, a group of traveling players where life and art begin to blend. And at the end, you're not sure if you're watching real life or if you're watching the, the uh, commedia play that they are putting on. Uh, these are things that are shocking and that use large orchestras and have passionate outbursts uh, and have larger structures. Essentially, they're Wagnerian. It's taking Wagner and French music and bringing it into Italian singing and into the Italian opera house. These pieces were somewhat controversial in that not every Italian was interested in giving up um, the style of Verdi and the bel canto, but they were popular enough that they took off and led to all of these big hits, and Puccini was one of these composers. Now, he did not write exclusively in the style of the Verismo. That's important, that Puccini uh, was not so much interested in kind of one way of doing opera. No, he had a much more kind of broad vision of what opera could be. But suffice it to say, we see many of these influences of the Verismo in looking at truth, realism, culture, society, shock, provocation, uh, in order to, uh, and, and allow those stories to sing. So to recap, we talked a little bit about the various eras of the 19th century in Italian opera and where we're coming to uh, with Madame Butterfly. And then we talked a little bit about the school of composition at which Puccini, uh, uh, which Puccini was a part of. And now that leads us to Giacomo Puccini himself, born in 1858, dying in 1924, which if you've been paying attention, you'll realize that we're coming up on the centenary of his death, which actually, when you think about it, isn't that long ago. We think about Puccini kind of representing the height of the operatic canon, along with some of these other names I've been bandying about, Verdi, Rossini, Wagner, etc., but Puccini saw World War I. He saw, you know, the decades in between. He had a car. He lived in the 20th century. He was a modern composer. Uh, and I think that's important to think about, especially as we look towards a new composition and modern opera taking off in a variety of ways, that Puccini was right there with the modernists at the beginning of the 20th century and living well into the first quarter of the century.
Puccini was born in Lucca, Italy, which is a fantastic town in Tuscany uh, in kind of north central Italy. Um, I had the pleasure of going there once and I highly recommend it if you have an Italian vacation coming up. And he was born into a very musical family. His family had um, uh, been church organists for generations. And so it was kind of assumed that young Puccini would take on that mantle. And so he received his earliest education from the church. Eventually, as an older student, he was sent to the conservatory in Milan. Remember those younger composers who were interested in all of these uh, uh, kind of currents, these cross currents that are happening in music are all uh, occurring in the Milan Conservatory. And so Puccini is soaking all that up. It's also worth noting that as a young man, Puccini saw a lot of theater. He was very interested in plays. He was very interesting, interested in and very discerning about the stories that he chose to uh, to adapt and to bring to the operatic stage. Eventually, Puccini would go on to not really write that many operas. He would really take time to figure out what he wanted to do. And a lot of that has to do with his theater training as a very young man. Uh, as I mentioned, he goes to the Milan Conservatory uh, in his early 20s. So he was a very old student, ultimately, at the time, but very quickly distinguished himself in a variety of ways. And he goes on to write his first operas, which were not particularly successful, but they were promising. They were Le Villi and Edgar. And these two pieces, particularly uh, Le Villi and then continuing uh, with the commissioning of Edgar, Puccini captures the eyes and the attention of Casa Ricordi. Now, what is all of that about? What is Casa Ricordi? That Casa, meaning house, of Ricordi. This is the name of a publishing firm in Italy, it's still in existence today, uh, that championed the works of the Bel Canto, that championed the works of Verdi. So we see that lineage we were talking about uh, continuing on to Puccini. And as uh, Verdi was becoming an old man, Verdi would eventually die in 1901, there was a lot of kind of angst about who was going to be the next Verdi. And after the earliest opera uh, by Puccini, Casa Ricordi begins to kind of latch on to him and say, I think this is our guy. I think this is the future of Italian opera. This will keep this tra uh, tradition going and moving forward well into the future. They maintain faith, even though his first two operas, as I mentioned, were only modest successes. Uh, but that investment pays off because immediately following uh, these first two outings, we get Puccini's first big success, Manon Lesco. This is a fantastic opera that has passionate singing, uh, high drama, high stakes, everything you kind of want in the Verismo with these mixing of social classes uh, and based on a, a really kind of realistic French novel that was very, very popular at the time. This was an absolute juggernaut uh, on the operatic stage. And he quickly follows up with La Boheme and Tosca, uh, two other um, pieces that are part of this uh, Verismo tradition that in the case of La Boheme introduces us to the um, impoverished uh, Bohemians in the Latin Quarter in Paris in the 1840s and Mimi and her tuberculosis and her love of Rodolfo. And then with Tosca, we get a political thriller uh, that is shocking and violent and um, uh, filled with drama. Now, all of these operas, it's worth noting, even though they, for us, represent kind of the height of operadom, they were not necessarily well received by critics. Um, critics were not necessarily on board with what Puccini was doing. They thought uh, these operas were kind of trite or were a little basic. Um, or were hodgepodge ideas. I mean, there were lots of different kind of takes on what Puccini was doing. But audiences loved them. 
And as Puccini's work starts to be done more and more and more, his fame takes off. He begins to travel around the world with various revivals of these operas in you know, Paris and in London and go, traveling all over different parts of Italy, uh, eventually to the United States. Uh, he actually um, eventually, eventually premiered an opera at the Met in 1910. So there's also an American connection. Puccini became the kind of man of the moment, if you will, with these hits. Uh, despite the critical, um, not backlash, but kind of mixed reviews that these pieces got. Which, as a quick side note, it's worth mentioning that Puccini, only until the past couple of decades, has really started being regarded as the serious composer that uh, that he was, and the the incredible mastery that he had of his craft. That's a pretty new thing, which I think is worth pointing out, that just because we assume something to be a part of the operatic tradition doesn't mean that it's not new or that it's not uh, uh, something that... Um, is a different direction than the way people were thinking about these things before. Following Tosca, uh, Puccini goes on to live an incredibly colorful life. That's a very kind of kind and polite way to put it. Uh, he would eventually marry a woman named Elvira, who uh, Puccini lived with um, since she was married to someone else for many years. Uh, there were many affairs. There was a disastrous event um, with a presumed affair with a, um, a young maid that actually led to her taking her own life. His uh, the life of Puccini was kind of that of the first celebrity. You know, if you think about the early 20th century, is kind of the idea of celebrity is becoming um, invented in many ways. Puccini is right there, uh, becoming this kind of first opera celebrity in a big way. It is during this period following La Boheme and Tosca around the year 1900 that he uh, really solidifies his relationship with his two main librettists. Now, librettists are the people who um, conceive of the structure of the story and write the poetry that Puccini would write his music to. And these two gentlemen are Luigi Illica and Giuseppe Giacosa. Uh, these two men would write the libretti for many operas, including Madama Butterfly. And essentially the way they worked is that Ilica would write the story. He would come up with a kind of dialogue version of the opera. And then Giacosa would come along and turn it into Italian verse. So here, even in the relationship to the librettists, you see kind of the tension between the Italian tradition, Italian poetry, with the more Wagnerian through composed dialogue based style of operatic expression. Uh, at this point, around the turn of the 20th century, Puccini is a wealthy man and he moves to an area outside Lake Como uh, at the Torre del Lago, the, the towers of, uh, on the lake. Uh, and that's where he was going to spend much of his life. When he's not traveling around with his operas, uh, this is where he writes. This is where he retreats in an interesting way. Now, in 1903, uh, Puccini gets his first car. Again, thinking about Puccini as a modern person. And would get into a disastrous uh, automobile accident, which would actually delay the writing and eventual premiere of Madama Butterfly, which wouldn't happen until 1904. So uh, this was a long recovery. This was a huge kind of wrinkle in the lead up to the opera that we will uh, be seeing in uh, just a couple of weeks or days, depending when you are watching this preview. Following Madama Butterfly in 1904, we're going to go look at those source materials and dive deeply into that in just a moment. But Puccini would go on to write many more operas. As I mentioned, he premieres an opera in 1910 at the Met. That's Fanciulla del West. Uh, he writes Suar Angelica, Gianni Schicchi, La Rondine, uh, and eventually writes his last masterpiece, Turandot, uh, which he does not finish. Um, and it is left um, uncompleted when he died in 1924 due to um, complications, essentially due to complications uh, uh, to undergoing a surgery for lung cancer. He has a had a heart um, uh, goes into cardiac arrest during that, uh, which would lead to his untimely death, uh, leaving turned out unfinished. So, Madame Butterfly represents this kind of halfway point 
in many ways in his career and the kind of end of this first series of big uh, juggernaut operas. However, the origins of this and the story how of how Madame Butterfly comes to be uh, was not smooth sailing. Like most of Puccini's operas, they were filled with drama, um, false turns, you know, all kinds of miscommunications, you name it. It occurred when bringing this opera to life. Now, when Puccini was in London in 1900 for a performance of, uh, of Tosca, Puccini saw a one-act play by American playwright David Belasco um, that was in turn based on a short story, there you see the uh, a cover of it there by John Luther Long, called Madame Butterfly. This uh, story is ultimately very simple. You have a young geisha who becomes married to an American, and he leaves her while she believes that she was fully married. Um, the American doesn't necessarily view it that way. There are miscommunications. Eventually, he comes back with his American bride, leading to catastrophic, uh, a catastrophic conclusion. So marriage between the geisha and the American, they separate. Uh, she holds out hope that he'll come back. He eventually does, but not in the way that she wishes. And in the original short story, uh, she attempts to take her life, but eventually does not succeed. Her, her nurse and her maid, Suzuki, uh, binds up her wounds. But in the David Belasco play, uh, she does succeed, leading to its shocking conclusion. This play is only noteworthy because A, it's the basis of the opera, and two, David Belasco was kind of a, a wizard of the theater, if you will, and he played with a lot of early lighting equipment and theater technology. And so as Butterfly is waiting for her love to return, there was this long sequence where through lighting and stage effects, uh, the theater transformed from night to morning, which was new. That was something you couldn't do before the turn of the 20th century. And so there was a lot of spectacle wrapped up into this. Now, both the, I want to be very clear that both the original short story and the play are terribly stereotypical. Um, they are filled with the worst kind of uh, depictions. There is no depth to these characters. Um, if it wasn't for Puccini's opera, we would not be talking about these pieces at all. And yet, they are what inspired Puccini. But I think it's worth noting that Puccini did not know English. So imagine, you're Puccini, you're in London, you're sitting down to see this play. Can't really tell what's being said because you don't understand the language. So all of the awful stereotypes, all of the ridiculous dialogue, all the two-dimensional characterizations that are taking place, Puccini's not necessarily picking up, per se. Instead, he's taking in the basic contours of the story. He's taking in the idea of this cultural clash and of the character of Butterfly herself. He's taking in the environment. He's taking in this magical spectacle transition from night to morning, and the general idea of the tragedy. And I think that's very, very important, that while the Belasco, uh, Belasco play and the short story are certainly the source material for the opera, it is a separate thing uh, because of this language barrier. Again, we have another kind of cultural uh, clash here as we have an Italian watching this play and starting to use it to adapt and to create a new opera of his own. Now, nothing comes from nothing. And so this play, the short story, comes from a long tradition in the 19th century in Europe of interest in Asia, particularly in Japan. In 1853, an American naval officer, Commodore Perry, goes to Japan and ends up being the first American and first Westerner uh, to establish a relationship with Japan, Japan after almost 200 years. Uh, by the end of the 1600s, Japan has essentially walled itself off from Western influence. And so when 
relations begin to take place again in the 1850s, there was a lot of curiosity. There was a lot of interest in Japan. And in particular, in 1867, when Paris housed uh, a uh, World's Fair, basically, uh, an, an exposition that featured uh, many artifacts and works of art and music and dance from Japan, it set off a craze in, um, in Europe. Uh, that would eventually lead to pieces like Gilbert and Sullivan's Mikado and others. This was a time of incredible exoticism. This is all wrapped up in the, the atrocities of colonialism of the 19th century. Uh, this is all wrapped up in a world that doesn't have recordings. So the only way to know what Japanese or Asian music sounds like is based on what you hear or what you think you hear. And all of these things are kind of building into the European psyche, leading up to the Belasco play. Additionally, it's worth noting that in 1887, so about 13 years before Puccini sees Madame Butterfly in London, uh, a novel um, that is reported to be a diary called, in English, Madame Chrysanthemum by Pierre Lotti is published and really kind of establishes many norms uh, in the European psyche for Japanese culture. Now, these norms are stereotypes. They are not necessarily based in reality or authenticity in any way. But from the European perspective, it kind of sets the tone or sets the conventions that they will continue to use. So you have all of these negative stereotypes. You have all these negative ideas that are influencing this craze for Japanese culture. So the question becomes, why is Madame Butterfly not a part of this? Or if it is, why do we condemn the Belasco play and grapple with this opera, Madame Butterfly? We'll get to that in just a second. But moving back to how Butterfly comes into being... As an opera, Puccini immediately reaches out when he returns to Italy to get the rights to the play and starts to work with his um, librettists immediately before they even get the permission from Velasco to write the opera. Which means that the opera itself, while it has the basic contours, the basic plot of its source material, it has a very different tone. It has a very different uh, scope than what we have in these other um, uh, works of literature and drama. After Puccini recovers from his automobile, automobile accident, after a lot of back and forth about how to tell the story, what locations should these be set in, uh, the opera eventually premieres in Milan in 1904. And it is an absolute disaster. I think about this when uh, new operas premiere and get kind of mixed reviews, that even Madame Butterfly, <laughs> one of the most popular operas of the, of the 20th century and beyond, uh, had a disastrous opening. Now, there is some evidence or there is some room that should be made for the fact that it's possible that the, the disaster, the booing and the catcalling and the um, insults that were kind of thrown at the stage during the premiere of Madame Butterfly uh, was orchestrated by Puccini's rivals, um, of which he he had many, um, and we can't rule that out. But it is worth noting that Puccini immediately withdrew the opera, but he did not lose faith in it. There was something about this story, there was something about this character that got under his skin, and he couldn't let it go. And so eventually uh, he revives and revises the opera, and a new version premieres uh, quickly after, which then leads to another revision for London, and then a final revision in Paris, which is the version that we most perform today. While we say Madame Butterfly uh, is from 1904, the version that we perform is from 1906 in Paris. But yet, because of when Ricordi publishes the score based on when people saw it, there really is no definitive version of Madame Butterfly. This is a work that Puccini continued to work on uh, as it took off and as it became the world-famous opera that we know and perform 
today. So let's recap. We started talking about the overall artistic periods and kind of context of Italy in the 19th century. We then honed in on the kind of school of composers that are coming of age in the 1890s, of which Puccini is a part, that are bringing shocking stories and violence and realism and a mixing of cultures and the influence of Wagner and French music, bringing this all together into the Italian opera house. We then talked a little bit about the profiles, the biographical profiles of Puccini himself and where Mount of Butterfly fits in his uh, collected work. And then the origins of the opera and its long road to not only its premiere in 1904, but also its subsequent revisions of which you will be seeing the last from the Paris production in 1906. So as we look at this, um, I want to now deal with some of the questions that you might have and that many people have about Madame Butterfly. How do we take this opera? How do we look at this opera, especially in light of all of the stereotypes that we talked about surrounding Japanese culture, the inauthenticity of this story and of this perspective? And then how do those ideas influence us as we are listening to the opera? And eventually, what are you going to see on the stage as Virginia Opera presents this production of Madama Butterfly today in 2024? Now, as we start to grapple with Mount and Butterfly, I want to be very clear. There are many different perspectives that need to be taken into account as we look at this opera. Uh, mine is by no means uh, authoritative. Uh, one of the things that's so great about opera today is all kinds of voices from all kinds of perspectives are a part of this conversation as we figure out what to do with this opera. But I think it's revealing, and this is now me personally speaking to you, I think it is revealing that we grapple with Madame Butterfly. There are plenty of operas that feature exotic locations that dabble or promote stereotypes or colonialism, things like that, that we just don't perform. Or at least if we do, it is very infrequent. And uh, those productions have a very specific reason to exist. I'm thinking about operas like Lakme, as beautiful as that duet is that we perform all the time. That is not an opera that we perform because of all of the negative reasons that we've been talking about. Uh, Bizet's The Pearl Fishers is another example of, of an opera that, that doesn't really have well-developed characters and that dabbles in these stereotypes and asserts a, a European vision of colonialism that we do not support today. So what about Butterfly? While the opera does um, have some inauthentic points in it, many of them actually. And while the opening act can, um, uh, especially as you meet Butterfly's family, have some stereotypical elements in it, um, it moves past them in intriguing ways. And the heart of Butterfly is the main character herself, Chocho-san, Madam Butterfly. This 15-year-old geisha girl because one of the things I want you to pay attention to as you listen to and as you then watch this opera is how she develops, how she moves from these kind of 19th century stereotypes to one of the most complete, complicated, grounded, strong, naive, brash, funny women to ever be on the operatic stage. In fact, act two in particular is almost a kind of one woman show as you are in her head. And we see her in a variety of conversations, a variety of situations. We learn about the stakes of her life, particularly the child that she has been keeping secret. Uh, that is Pinkerton's, which explains why she won't and can't move on from the relationship that she's waiting on. Um, she is incredibly well-rounded. Pay attention to her discussion of religion and how she views the American gods or the God of America versus the gods of Japan. Pay attention 
to how she interacts with the American consul who serves um, as a kind of uh, balance to the naval officer, Lieutenant Pinkerton, uh, exercising caution, but ends up being relatively feckless in his ability to help Butterfly in anything, any meaningful way. Pay attention to how the dialogue between the two of them unfolds. For Pinkerton said that he would return when uh, the, the robins begin to nest again, essentially when it's springtime. And early in Act Two, she asks Sharpless, the American consul, when do robins nest in America? Is it possible that while they've nested many times here in Japan, maybe they nest differently in America? Can you tell me? To ask that question gives us great insight into this person. Yes, there is a naivete to that question that she asks, but there's also great intelligence. There's great curiosity. We see her do something that we don't see many operatic characters do, which is work through a problem. Normally in opera, a problem is presented and then immediately we get solution. With Butterfly, we see the wheels turn. We see her figuring out information. We see her trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together in a way that makes sense to her and that moves beyond the stereotype into the realm of the fully human. Pay attention later on with the American Consul when a letter from Pinkerton is eventually read. And she doesn't pay attention to the words that are being said. She's just so overcome with emotion. When have you or I ever had moments in our lives where that's happening, where something we've been waiting on, something that we've been hoping for, something we've been praying for, uh, we get to that moment and we actually aren't paying attention to ourselves and paying attention to the environment around us. That's what Butterfly's doing here. It is one of the most beautiful and heartbreaking moments in the entire opera is this very simple exchange as a letter is being read and a person responds. And so this central performance, the central humanity that lies at the center of Madame Butterfly, uh, for me, is what allows us to still perform this work, that allows us to want to perform this work, to want to make this piece come alive because she is so utterly compelling. We are so fully in her head and we are so fully on her side and we see her from so many different perspectives in a way that just many classic opera characters um, are not allowed to develop. She changes, she grows, she makes mistakes, she is triumphant. In essence, this 15-year-old geisha girl is allowed to be tragic. Think about that. If the idea of Puccini and of this younger school of composition is all about bringing the myths of Wagner and the grandiosity of his orchestra and the subconsciousness of all of these different musical ideas that are introduced again and again and again throughout the opera, we're taking the kind of mythicness of Brunhilde, of the gods, in putting it into a 15-year-old woman who her own society has turned its back on. And she is allowed to sing. She is given the inner life of a god. That is a strong thing that I think Puccini has done. And I think we can, I think we recognize it, whether consciously or not, when we look at this opera. That we are all capable of being Brunhildas. And I think that is the, you know, or Votons or, or what have you. And I think that is ultimately at the heart of Puccini's art, is taking this grandeur of emotion and distilling it to the human level. That's what he did best through his orchestras, through his melodies, through the contrast between the text and what the orchestra is saying, and how characters interact on stage, and the stories that he chooses to tell. These are deeply human, and yet are allowed to have the inner lives of giants. And I think that is powerful. I think that's profound. And I think that's why Madame Butterfly is in a different class from many of the European works of art that we've alluded to and talked about thus far.
Now, that isn't my answer for why we grapple with this. It is an incomplete one. But I hope it gives you some insight and ways into thinking about this story, thinking about this music from its 19th century context. Now let's turn our attention to the music itself. And I want to uh, continue by talking about kind of this idea of taking Wagnerian grandeur and putting it into this, uh, this young woman. I want to play the very beginning of her most famous aria. And even though Puccini operas are larger structures than just aria recitative, again, we're kind of in this late 19th century, early 20th century uh, mode, Puccini still loves an aria. He's still an Italian composer. And we get this great moment where at the beginning of Act Two, Butterfly is talking to Suzuki um, years after Pinkerton has left. And she paints this picture, this, this dream, this American dream, if you will, of what will happen when he returns. She's imagined this so many times that she has every detail planned out. And she shares that vision with Suzuki. And how many of us can't relate to that, to wanting something so badly that we've envisioned it so many times that it becomes real. And the text of this is one fine day, one beautiful day, we will see smoke on the horizon, the ship will get nearer, and then continues to tell that story. And notice how beautiful the melody is. Notice how dreamlike it is. Notice how strong it is coming from the body of this young girl in Nagasaki, Japan. By the way, I'm sharing with you historic recordings of Butterfly throughout the 20th century. Uh, so there we have Maria Callas singing this uh, this aria. And that motive, da, 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 will go on to kind of represent the, the hope that Butterfly has. It will eventually be sung with a blaring orchestra and the soprano singing as fully and lyrically and as triumphantly as possible. We see the strength of this woman uh, very clearly in this aria. Speaking of motives, I want to share with you, there are many motives, there are many themes that exist throughout this opera. And they uh, are sometimes very subtle and sometimes not. It's also worth noting that Puccini, um, to the best of his ability, I would say, looked to be influenced by authentic Japanese music. He did go a little bit out of his way um, to collect folk songs, um, to collect that sound. Now, was it imperfect? Absolutely. Could he have tried a little harder? Maybe. Uh, but this was written in a time when there were no field recordings. The field of ethnomusicology uh, was in its nascent stages, ethnomusicology being the studying of music from a variety of cultural perspectives. Um, and so Puccini is using that material as well. Um, again, sometimes it, it crosses into inauthenticity and into stereotypes, and sometimes it helps to create this cohesive world in which Butterfly specifically inhabits. One of the first themes you will hear is introduced at the very beginning of the opera. And this is a theme that um, has a variety of contexts, but I like to think about it as kind of the hustle and bustle and anxiety theme, that this kind of appears whenever there's lots of action happening. And the opera opens as Pinkerton arrives for the day of the wedding. He is getting a tour of his new house with all the uh, soji screens that kind of glide, and he's uh, fascinated by that, uh, and filled with um, brash, stupid ideas about what it means to be a person of the world. And so here's one of the first themes that you'll hear that represents the hustle and the bustle of everyday life. <laughs> 
So if you're paying attention, that theme is moving to different parts of the orchestra, making a fugue, the kind of music that you know Bach would write or something like that. And one of the things I think is interesting about this musical theme as it appears throughout the opera is that it has a kind of sinisterness to it. It's not just activity. It is tension. It is anxiety. And it will be used to evoke those ideas as well. Interestingly, uh, the American National Anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, although it was not the national anthem at the time, but it was, you know, a, a patriotic song, the Japanese National Anthem, all of these are also used as American or as, as motives um, for Americans and the Japanese throughout the opera. So you get this kind of extra musical material, whether it be the folk songs that we talked about um, from Japan, the American National Anthem, and other themes throughout, creating a very realistic verismo soundscape for this drama to unfold. Here we have Pinkerton's first aria uh, that begins with a statement of the National Anthem of the Star Spangled Banner, as you will hear. And he goes on to give his kind of creed of what it is to be traveling around the world, not giving a care for things, and of soaking up life to the fullest. Now, this character will um, eventually uh, be humbled, and actually his um, one of his, his final lines in the opera, after he sings a little ariette uh, at the end of the, uh, or in the, the beginning of the final scene, um, he realizes that he's a coward. There is a complete devolution of this character uh, that is interesting. One of the things that I would encourage you to do as you see Butterfly is if there are parts of it that you're uncomfortable with, stick with it. See what happens. See who ends up being right. Because this opera is actually um, condemns uh, colonialism. It condemns um, the perspective of Pinkerton. And I think it illustrates more than almost any other opera that depicting something on stage is not the same as condoning it. So we hear from Pinkerton, we get his perspective, but this opera is not on his side. And we see this in a variety of ways. So here we get more motivic material at the beginning of Pinkerton's Act One. Yankee Vagabond, <laughs> he calls himself. And so that melody is going to be associated with Pinkerton throughout the opera. A couple of other uh, fabulous uh, motives that we get. Um, two very contrasting ideas. The first I want to play for you is arguably one of the most dramatic moments in the opera. This is when Butterfly reveals her son uh, to the American consul, which explains why she won't remarry to anyone else, why she won't take uh, the abandonment, her abandonment uh, as a sign for divorce. Uh, it's all about this child and what is going to happen to this child, what she should do as a mother. And listen to this melody. This becomes a motive that will associate with the child and, and also just butterfly in general and it's just one of the stunning moments of butterfly's strength and stunning moments of Puccini's score. What about this? What about this child? And this is what is so great about Puccini, is that if you were to make a movie of this moment, you would have a young girl, a little kid, and a middle-aged man 
sitting on kind of the top of the hill in Nagasaki, Japan, no one else around, having a conversation. But what does Puccini do? He gives us the inner life of the character. And we get the strength of this mother. We get the love. We get the fierceness. We get the fearfulness. Uh, we get the vulnerability. We get all of this wrapped up in this musical moment. Contrasting uh, this kind of moment of monumentalism and this theme of the child that we get throughout, we also get the humming chorus. And this is a moment at the end of Act Two as Butterfly is sitting, waiting for Pinkerton. He's We've seen his ship in the harbor. He is coming back and what's going to happen. And she has that vigil, the same that we talked about in the Belasco play. And Puccini creates just this moment of tranquil waiting um, that is one of the most sublime moments of Western music. This melody is also what accompanies that conversation that I talked about with Sharpless and Butterfly in the reading of the letter coming to fruition as the crickets are humming, night falls, and Butterfly stock still waiting for what's going to happen. So you're hopefully hearing kind of the monumentalism, the intimacy, the specificity, the Frenchness, the Germanness, the Italianness, all wrapped up into one of Puccini's greatest creations. One final piece of music that I want to play. This comes from the Act One duet between Pinkerton and Butterfly. She's been abandoned by her family for she has converted to Christianity against the, the wishes of everyone else in her family, and especially her priest uncle. Um, and she, in this love duet, basically is coming to terms with the fact that none of that matters because she's found love. Um, but there's a moment of caution when she says, uh, Pinkerton, you know, calls her by her name, Butterfly. And she says, but in your part of the world, don't people collect butterflies and stick them with pins and put them on, put them on boards under glass, and we are introduced to one of the uh, more interesting musical themes in the entire opera that is essentially the, the kind of tragedy of Butterfly, the anxiety um, that will be mixed in with these other melodies that I've introduced you to and many others to create the kind of subconsciousness, to create the inner world, to create the environment upon which this uh, epic tragedy of human proportion uh, will play out. Across the sea, when you collect butterflies, That melody da 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 is gonna appear throughout. It introduces the opening of Act Two. Be listening to this music because it gives you psychological insight into this woman, into this situation, and helps us take in this three-dimensional creation uh, that Puccini has, um, consciously or not, created in Madama Butterfly. Now, this particular production that you'll be seeing, one of the ways that we have grappled with uh, Madame Butterfly is we have assembled an all-female, all-Asian team uh, uh, in order to create this production. Uh, stage director Mojo, who is a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, uh, stage director, um, directed all around the world, um, and has never um, been really that interested in doing a Madden Butterfly until now. Um, but with this creative team from their particular 
perspectives and vantage points are going to be um, grappling with this character, with this story, and with this human drama. They therefore have uh, transposed the story to a slightly different time, although the setting is still the same, which brings in a variety of other um, ideas as it is now set in 1946 Nagasaki, which, um, as you know, following the um, end of World War II was a dramatically changed location due to um, the dropping of the atomic bomb. And so we see not just a cultural explosion here, but we see the fallout from literal war. We see Butterfly grappling with a post-war American dream we see her disillusionment with what is happening in the wider world around her and with her own specific um, situation in a place that has been so devastated by warfare. Uh, Act two takes place six years later in 1952. And so we see that play out as well. And so I'm very interested and curious and excited to see what that change does to this opera in the, how we look at it as people in 2024, how our relationship towards it shifts a little bit. Same music, same words, same story, but with a slightly different context that I think will bring to the fore many very real concerns about how we interact in the world, how we interact with culture, how we interact with the ideas of different cultures. And I think will um, allow us to look at this opera the way that we're supposed to, which is through very serious eyes. This is not an opera to be looked at um, as just a pretty bit of entertainment. This opera is deeply serious, and I'm excited to see how this very serious time will be reflected and will allow us to lean forward and to, to, to be indicted a little bit by what it is that we see on stage. Top-notch cast is joining us as well. We are almost out of time, actually a little over, uh, but I'll just put them up here. Some uh, incredible Virginia Opera debuts, some returning uh, voices for you. You are in for a musical and dramatic treat as again, we get inside the head of one of the most complete characters to ever be depicted in an opera in one of the great masterpieces of Western operatic uh, repertoire that brings together kind of everything we've been looking at throughout this entire season, from the Italian bel canto to the Wagnerian influence of motive and orchestra and beyond. This, I think, is a wonderful way to end the season, and I can't wait to see you at the opera.